All right, everybody, time for another episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and Q&A live stream here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel. As always, I'm Matt Cheerfully here to help you maximize your potential with minimalist approaches to diet and exercise. And as a reminder, check down below in the description for the full complete list of RDP books in the RDP library, because that's how I support these podcasts and this channel is through sale of the books like Overcoming Isometrics, Grind Style Calisthenics, and smart body weight training. So diving into today's topic, we're talking about how do you know if an exercise is going to be an effective vehicle for helping you build muscle and strength? It's one of those things that's like, well, everybody's got new exercises, there's always new things in the magazines, but how do you know if it's gonna be a viable way to go or if it's just gonna be basically a waste of your time? And today I wanna to discuss three characteristics that you want to check off for exercises that are going to stand the best chance at helping to stimulate strength and muscle growth. So let's just jump right in. Uh, the first characteristic is a wide range of progressive adjustment. So you can go from either very low or extremely high levels of tension in the muscle. So you want to look at things like progression of resistance, whether it's weight, bands, technique, what have you, you wanna make sure that you can basically take your muscle from, I could do this all day to, oh my gosh, I could probably only do this for a couple of seconds and everywhere in between. You don't wanna be limited in how hard you can work the muscle and how much tension you can generate with it. And you can do this with uh, maybe sometimes a little bit of creativity, you know, like push-ups, pull-ups and stuff, different techniques, adding weight to something like that. But even when you're mindful of like, buying equipment. Uh, when I was working in the equipment industry, I always was very mindful of, well, how heavy do I go with this? Oh, these adjustable weights go to 45 pounds each. Uh, that's not quite high enough. Like I want to make sure that there's more resistance or potential to make my muscles work hard than I'll probably ever really need, like buying a sports car with a thousand horsepower. I'll probably never need it, but it's nice to know it's there. So you know that the ability to make the muscle have a lot of tension is not limited. So that's characteristic number one, wide range of tension or progressive resistance. The second characteristic is you want to make sure that the exercise, uh, it holds up very well under fatigue. And the reason for this is because you can have a very high level of uh, tension when you're fresh, but as you go through the reps or you're holding for time, does your form break down? Is the stress starting to go into your joints? Do you feel like you're having trouble staying stable and able to continue the exercise? And the reason for this is because you want to make sure you can push your muscles to an insanely high level of fatigue. But if the exercise you're doing is kind of shortchanging you, as soon as you start to get like a little fatigued, you have to stop. And that's a sign that you can't push it nearly as far. So classic exercises like this, again, classic body weight exercises, things where you feel like you're safe because you have a spotter in the free weight world. Machines, very good for this sort of thing. Um, bands are can typically work. Generally, you wanna make sure that you're feeling very stable. And even if your form starts to break down, you're not much at a risk of something going pop, snap, or zing. Uh, you you want to be able to basically even continue if your form is breaking down to some degree. It's not really going to compromise you very much. So that's kind of something to pay attention to of when you're doing your workouts, especially if you're doing anything circuit training, are you losing the ability to push yourself really high into that fatigue zone? Uh, the more complicated the exercises are, the harder that's going to be. And that's why the third characteristic is something you want to be paying attention to, which is, is it relatively low skill? Now, this is something that really should be hammered home when it comes to building muscle, because a thought, uh, a lot of times when it comes to exercise, we're kind of drawn to the fancy, the stuff that's flashy, the stuff that gets a lot of likes on social media and stuff. And that's great. But sometimes it's easy to make that correlation jump between, wow, that's really an impressive use of acrobatics and stuff. That must also mean that it's really hard to do. Therefore, it also must be really hard on the muscle. Therefore, really hard to build muscle and strength. And usually the opposite is the case for most people. Because when you have something that requires a high degree of skill, that fatigue, that ability to push your muscle, 
that ability to push yourself into that red zone and keep it there for an extended period of time, that stuff gets greatly reduced because as soon as your form starts to break down, or even if your concentration is just a little off or you're having an off day, your ability to push the muscle with a lot of tension for a good amount of time is severely compromised. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that you can't build muscle with things like one arm handstands and skill work and Olympic lifting and all that sort of thing. You can build muscle with anything that works your muscles to some degree. But what we're looking at here is what's going to make it the easiest for you. Or I guess the word I'm really looking for is reliability. What kind of techniques are going to help you produce the most reliable stimulus for helping you build muscle and strength? Because you can have a great workout with a skill-induced exercise or something with a limited amount of resistance range and just the stars align just right. And you think, oh, wow, I really push my muscles. The next day you're feeling sore and you think, wow, that was really great. But can you make it happen regularly? Can you make it happen almost every single time you're using those exercises? That's what you really want to pay attention to. Like on your worst day, can you still make something happen? So let's talk some examples here, right? The basic examples of the exercises that satisfy this are the most basic movement patterns. In the past couple of episodes, I've had people asking me questions like, the basics, I'm getting bored with the basics, getting tired of the basics, that sort of thing. But the reason why the basics endure is because they satisfy those characteristics the best. Basic push, basic pull, basic squatting movements. You can also put that into the category of unilateral. So one arm push, one arm pull, one legged style of squat techniques like lunges, Bulgarian split squats, one legged leg presses, these sorts of things to help you mitigate any sort of imbalances between your right and left side. So the basics are what's best for fulfilling those characteristics, therefore usually the best at helping you to optimize your chances of building muscle and strength. The stuff that's not going to be there are the stuff where you really got to have a lot of skill to do it. Like, okay, I'm on a BOSU ball on one leg, juggling flaming kettlebells, singing the Star Spangled Banner, and trying to make Jiffy Pop popcorn at the same time. Like the fancy stuff, it's cool. It's great. I'm not saying it doesn't do anything and it shouldn't be something you can strive for if that's what you want. But don't bet that it's really going to be the best and most reliable vehicle for helping you push your muscles to a high degree of tension for a very long period of time or really into that red zone. It's much harder to do. Granted, you can probably get much more out of it as your skills improve. Absolutely. You know, there are some people out there who can bang out freestanding handstand pushups, and it's a fantastic muscle building and strength building exercise for them. But that's because their skill level with it is so advanced that they can push with a lot of resistance. They can push to a high degree of fatigue. So it is very relative to you. You've got to make your own judgment call with the exercise. For some people out there, things like lunges are not a good leg building exercise because their hip stability and their mobility just isn't there. They're kind of wobbling all over the place as they get tired and fatigued. So something with a bilateral or two-legged approach is probably gonna be better until that hip stability improves. And again, that's also why the grind style calisthenics method starts off with tension control and stability exercises, because those help to improve the tension control, improve your stability and improve your mobility and quote, the skill work that ensures that even the most basic exercises that you're doing are as rock solid as possible. And that way you can push them to a much higher level. And then in the grind phase of grind style calisthenics, you'll notice those exercises are relatively boring. They're not that fancy. They're not that complicated. They're very, very basic compound movements. And the whole point of that is to give you the best chance of pushing your muscles as hard as possible for as long as possible in that phase. And then the hypertrophy phase or the, the finisher phase is basically an easier version or a targeted version of exactly what you did during the grind phase, just to make sure you're getting all your ducks in a row. You're targeting maybe an area that you wanted to make sure you put a little bit more emphasis into like your biceps or your rear deltoids and, uh, or you're just doing a basic compound movement. Like say you were doing pull-ups, weighted pull-ups, and then for a finisher, you do weighted rows just to make sure you're really pushing the muscle to a higher degree. So really basic, 
relatively boring, but make sure that you're pushing your muscles to a very high level of tension for a good period of time. And you're feeling rock solid, safe, and stable throughout the entire time. Even on your worst days, those are the characteristics you want to look for, for exercises and workouts that are going to give you the best chance of building muscle and strength. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a cheat sheet. Now you can look at blogs and magazines. Does anybody even read any magazines anymore? But when someone's like, dude, this exercise, it's awesome. It's great and stuff. You can say, how uh, much range of tension can I use? How deep into the red zone can I push myself? And does it feel relatively safe and stable even under uh, a lot of fatigue? If it passes those, chances are you got a pretty good exercise. If it's pretty weak in one of those areas, it, it's not bad. I'm not saying don't experiment with it, but it's probably not going to be as good as something with a little bit more of a boring, plain Jane vanilla approach to it. So hopefully that gives you something to think about. Thank you very much. For listening, let's go right on into the Q&A section here. Everybody is on here. Uh, everybody is daily. Uh, again, it's a Henry Reed. All right. Well, everybody's on Albert Questions. Michael, how you doing? Michael, uh, echoing my statement, you're only as strong as you are unstable. Gotta be the 11th commandment, absolutely. It's And it, keep in mind too, that stability isn't just physical stability either. Like it's not just being able to stand into a plank with one arm or something. It's also emotional stability, mental stability. Um, I got a good lesson in that. I have a funny story to tell you. So this past weekend, I went and I did this bike race in Vail. Of course, a bike race in air quotes. Basically, everybody took off and I was way behind. And uh, what ended up happening was I did the 50 mile version. I opted for the 50 mile cutoff. And even though I did the shorter version, it still took me 12 hours to complete. And it was 12 hours of cardio. I got more cardio on Saturday than most people do in a month. And I'm still recovering. You can probably see in my face, I'm a little like, little ashen uh, look, I'm still trying to recover. But here's the thing, that fit day was very hard for me physically. I got to the point where I was just pushing my bike up the hills. I did not have it in my legs to even ride my bike up some of those hills. Physically, I just was very tired, exhausted for whatever reason. Uh, even from the get-go, I was like, I'm really not up for this sort of thing. But mentally and emotionally, I was solid as a rock the entire time. Now, I've been in races that were even 45 minutes long and I just kind of fell apart uh, due to whatever reasons, the weather, I was stressed about something going on between the ears or something. And I just had no mental or emotional stability, therefore it just crumbled. But on Saturday, I was very stable inside. And sure, I wasn't very the fastest guy, but I was able to at least make my way back to Vail. So always remember that stability is much more than just physical. Let's see. Uh, um, questions. Uh, I just started getting into overcoming ISOs with the forearm forklift. Let's see how it works for me. Yeah, everybody asked me about the forearm forklift and I've never used it. I have my ISO loop, of course. Uh, it's uh, basically the same idea. It's some sort of a nylon strap that prevents you from moving. So you can push and pull against it as hard as possible. Love to hear what uh, your uh, experience is there, Ebenezer, but uh, basically as long as it holds you. And going back to the topic of what makes a good exercise, like right? high range of tension, easy uh, push into the red zone, safe and relatively safe and stable under fatigue. I mean, that's isometrics in uh, a nutshell right there. So fantastic uh, way, definitely highly recommended. Uh, Henry, uh, hey Matt, I can bang out a few respectable clutch flags. Fantastic for about 10 seconds each. That's actually really respectable, well done. But can't even get my feet off the ground for the starting press flag progressions, either side, any suggestions? Um, yes, absolutely. First off, <laughs> funny story about the clutch flag in convict conditioning too. The clutch flag is a very respectable exercise for sure. Years ago uh, in like, like seventh or eighth grade, I forget, I was on a field trip. And of course this is when uh, your junior high hormones are cracking in. All the guys are trying to peacock and try and impress whoever's around with a double X chromosome. Right? Me and the guys were trying to talk big and this one guy, we're walking down the street and he just goes over to a lamppost and bang, perfect clutch flag. Not even 
uh, made it look easy kind of thing. And we are all, all the girls are like, oh, wow, that's so impressive. And we're all like, oh, Jesus, we're done before we even start. So every time I think clutch flags, I think of that scenario. I was like, all right, that was a mic drop moment if there ever was one. So very good, Henry, if you are getting that clutch flag, congratulations. So a lot of times the um, uh, press flag uh, progressions and everything, you can do this a couple of ways. You can go with a diagonal where you are like on a frame uh, where one hand is on a horizontal bar and the other one is on a vertical bar. So your body is at a diagonal of about 45 degrees. That's kind of like a little bit of a progression. So that teaches you how to be stable and have your body straight, even though you're not totally against gravity or not parallel. The other option, of course, is to uh, kick yourself way up. So you're vertical and then you come back down. It's kind of like a negative. Sometimes people do that with front levers as well, where they'll hang upside down and they'll come down as strong and hold it as best they can. And then they kind of pass through come down under control, don't hit the ground with impact. And that can kind of be a way to learn to do that as well. So that's where I would start, Henry. Um, bending your knees is also very good, just keeping yourself as tucked as possible. So uh, it's like the clutch flag, but when you're doing the um, uh, regular uh, clutch flag, you can also just extend the legs out further if you're not fully extended. Keeping your hips extended is also a good way to go about that. So usually, again, the advice is whenever you're stuck like, and you can't seem to bridge the gap to a higher level of progression, usually means there's more progression at the level you're at that needs to be addressed. Just something a little bit here and there to improve stability or tension control. Thank you so much for question. Let's see, uh, Kimberly, push plateau, push-ups, bench, haven't advanced in six months. Any suggestions? Maybe need better mind-muscle connection? Yeah, that's always a uh, possibility, absolutely. I recommend starting off warming up with either of those with the press together, so pressing your palms together, light that chest right on up, especially if you're feeling it in the shoulders predominantly. Usually when we're feeling a lot in the shoulders, that means the chest or the back isn't working nearly as much as we want it to be. And those are your big prime movers. So you've got the big guns not involved, so you're relying on small little muscles to get the job done. You're just not gonna bring a lot to the table. So definitely recommend some uh, chest uh, palm pressing uh, as a warm up. A couple of sets, five seconds or so. You don't want to be too fatigued. Uh, the other thing too is uh, squeeze the bar on the bench. That can also help. Make sure your back is lit up, and also on the bench, make sure you're driving your feet into the floor as hard as possible. A lot of bench press power comes from the lower body. Glutes engaged, hamstrings engaged, uh, making sure that your whole body is tense. It's kind of like lightning going through your body. The weight goes through, the, the resistance of the weight goes through your body and you wanna come in down to the floor where you're very stable. If it's just going straight down and back into the shoulders, it's a short distance and you're leaving a lot of your uh, body out of the equation. So it's gonna be harder to have the stability and the strength to really keep going. Uh, and as I was mentioning before, get more or progress the technique of what you're already doing. So this is why sometimes I'll recommend people do what I call a freeze workout, where I'll say, I don't want you doing any more reps and I don't want you adding any weight whatsoever to what you're currently doing. You're not allowed to, you have to stay at that level. And now that forces your mind to be like, well, how am I gonna make it harder for myself with the same weight and reps. And there's lots of ways. You can go with range of motion. You could do a pause at the most uh, sticking point. You can activate the muscles harder, as I was saying. There's lots of ways to do this, but I find it's often easier to make progress if you spend several weeks forcing yourself not to progress any of the metrics like weight and reps. So that way you can get really good at the ones that you are. And then the extra weight and reps will just come right along. Fantastic question, Kimberly. Thank you so much. All right, daily coming up. Give us a good forearm grip strength workout. Oh, the towel hangs from convict conditioning too are really good. Basically anything you're hanging off of works. Uh, we work our grip hanging, hanging on bars, hanging on towels. Uh, when we're doing pushing work, especially like on handstands, you want to kind of grip the floor a little bit with your fingers. That gets your extensors pretty good. I do this on the regular. I did this in a video where I said, basically, you can make your wrist turn into bulletproof if you do an isometric. This is in my book, Overcoming Isometrics. Try and show it here. But uh, you take your palm and you curl it into a tight fist, tighten your fist, and then you basically make like you're trying to turn, touch your fingers to your forearm. So I'm doing a forearm flexion as hard as I can. I can't quite get in the camera there. So I'm basically just flex, flex, flex. And usually I'm just doing this with my arms by my side. 
So that way it's, it's not like up here, but flex it as hard as you can. And then what you do is you open your hand as wide as you can, really stretch the fingers out, and then you pull like you're trying to get your fingers to your forearm. And you're gonna uh, turn on all of your extensors, hard, 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 about 10 to 15 seconds each, and you're just going back and forth. Practice that on the daily, and that will definitely improve your tension control in your forearms, make your wrists absolutely bulletproof, and that will carry over into all of the things that will build a lot more strength and muscle too, and all your pulling movements for sure. And that's good forearm stuff because you're only as strong as your grip, as they always say. Drake, what are your thoughts on rest pause training, similar techniques? Yeah, this is going along the lines of what I was saying of anything that can get your muscles to go to a higher level of fatigue is probably gonna be beneficial for helping you build muscle. So there's lots of ways you can do this because when we hit quote failure, we're not hitting any sort of actual failure in our muscle. We're only hitting failure under that exact circumstance, that technique, that weight, that tempo, that speed, we're, it's very conditional. Your muscles still have plenty of juice left in them. So that's why bodybuilders often employ techniques to keep pushing their muscles beyond what they had. So pause rest training is like you push as much as you can and then you would like stop, take a breath and then go right into it again, get one or two. So you're constantly going into that red zone. It's kind of like a rev meter on an automobile, just pin it, pin it, pin it, pin it. So instead of going into the red and then allowing it to come all the way back and recovering and then coming all the way up and then recovering, you're just red line, red line, red line, red line, red line. Very good technique. I like it very much. Uh, just again, as always, make sure though that it doesn't get uh, lend itself to certain abuses. You want to make sure that when you're pressing or uh, doing any sort of exercise where you're pushing your muscle hard in that red, you want to feel like you quickly kind of kind of falter a little bit. So instead of going red and it's pinning, 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 you want to push the muscle so hard that it's like red zone, red zone, and I can't possibly do it anymore. So it, it quickly falters off. That's what you're really trying to do is get your muscle to a high degree of fatigue and suddenly you just cross this line and you're like, I got not much left. So that's where we, we're going with that. All right. Nicholas, what are your what do you think of knuckle push-ups? This just came up the other day. A friend of mine and I were talking about it in the gym. I always felt very weird about knuckle push-ups because I don't know what knuckles to rest on. Uh, maybe I'm built like this, or maybe it's a martial arts thing, but you know, these two knuckles here on the inside of closest to my thumb are much bigger. So I can't put a flat fist on the ground. Um, I can either be on these knuckles, which tends to uh, twist the wrist a little bit, or it's these, which is twisted the other way. Uh, so maybe I'm better off if I have like a pad or a towel or something. Either way though, I mean, if you're comfortable being on your knuckles, awesome, fantastic, wonderful, great. Anything that's going to strengthen your wrists, build up that straight line strength. That's why martial artists do it. So that way we don't hit something and we break our wrists. And sometimes that's called a boxer's fracture. And uh, we wanna make sure we're very strong and can handle impact that way. That's why we do push-ups that way. You can also find you can get a little more range of motion if you have the shoulder mobility for it to get down even further as well. And it's also beneficial because you can get to a neutral or even an underhanded grip when you're doing push-ups. Try doing push-ups on your knuckles with your palms facing towards your chin, kind of like this sort of a position. Really good for getting maximum uh, shoulder, uh, not extension, um, external rotation, stable uh, scaps. And uh, I actually, Kimberly, try that too. That might be a good one to help you uh, break out of a push-up plateau if you can handle being pressing on your knuckles. So Nicholas, awesome question. Thank you very much. Adam, good question here. Should I count reps or do it until failure for calisthenics? It's always kind of a mind game, isn't it? And that's the, the thing with muscle, is pushing our muscles hard is always between the ears. And uh, different ways of perceiving the exercise are going to change how you think about working it. Like one of the ways that you can break out of a plateau is stop counting your reps. Because if you're always doing like say 20 push-ups, your mind builds that habitual neural pattern of oh, 17, 18, 19, well, we're in the upper teens, we must be getting tired. Time to start making you feel tired versus sometimes people will say don't count reps and they'll just blow right past their repetition range. So sometimes going against reps will work, timed workouts. I did a great video on timed sets 
on the RDP YouTube channel just the other day. Fun thumbnail with a Back to the Future theme and everything. It took me longer to make the thumbnail than it did to actually make the video. But um, counting reps can also be good at being honest, though. Sometimes you'll find people who'll be like, eh, I just do it for whatever. Eh, I just do it for until I'm tired or till failure and stuff. Because we can fool ourselves into failure. It happens all the time. People are like, that's failure. And then you give them some little Jedi mind trick of uh, not counting or counting or imagine uh, a scenario where I give you $100 if you go in, the boom, they blow right past it. So failure is very subjective. It's not an absolute thing by a long shot, especially in beginners. More experienced trained lifters, much more concrete and objective. But uh, for those who are just starting off, especially with a new exercise, you're not really that sure on how far you can really push it. And that's a good thing because you can push it a lot further when you're not quite that sure. So I would say, Take a stopwatch just to answer this question. See what you can do the most of for time. So do you get more time of doing push-ups for, pu for reps or do you get more time doing it till failure? That's gonna tell you what you need to do. Um, whatever's longest is gonna be the better one uh, to go with. All right. Hey Matt, what do you think is the most impressive skill? Planche front lever, Back lever, human flag, do you train for those? I don't really do any of the skill stuff, largely because what I would, had mentioned earlier, like I, I've always just kind of like, well, what kind of movement pattern would I do in the gym? Like I, I always, when I got into calisthenics, I was like, I want to do body weight training and basically make my body work and move and feel as if I was on this weight machine. That was what I was trying to do. How do I get weight machine and free weight experience through body weight training? So for me, like the front lever, um, not the front lever, like the, the muscle up, to me, that's like going over to the pull up machine, uh, the pull down and doing one rep of a pull down and then walking over to the dip machine and doing one dip and then going over and doing one pull up and then one dip. And it's like, I wouldn't do that in a weight uh, training workout. So it's good for the sake of doing the exercise, like is the goal to do the exercise. But the goal for me has never been to do the exercise. Like I don't care about my planche. I, I could care less. If I die on my deathbed and I've never done a single one of those, I would have no regrets just because they're not important to me. Uh, it's not that they're unimportant. It's just not important to me. When I'm doing my body weight exercise or any exercise, I'm just saying, hey, muscle, I want to work you as hard as I can as easily as possible. And some of those are great for that. Like the back lever, if I were to choose one, would definitely be the back lever because, man, you can light up your lats real hard on that. Uh, but uh, usually you have to go with a fairly easy progression to do it for a good amount of volume. Usually people front lever and they're just holding it and then they drop and it's like three seconds. So uh, very impressive stuff. Certainly can be good for building muscle and strength. Not saying it's not, but uh, that's um, uh, my, my two cents there. But anyway, to answer the question, most impressive skill, I would say probably the one I have the hardest time with, which would probably be, I mean, the planche just seems like Superman. Like I don't even know how people do that sort of thing. Uh, every once in a while, I'll grab onto a, a set of uh, paralytes or a kettlebell, cut a couple of kettlebells or something, lean forward. I'm like, how do people do that? It just feels impossible. And that's the allure of those things is they seem impossible and you work on them and stuff. And then one day you, you make progress and you feel like you're a superhero. Uh, so there's, there's my answer to that one. All right. A good point by Michael. In my journey, protein powder is only a fill in the holes thing. There's no substitute for natural food. Echo that. Absolutely. I actually always looked at protein powder as like a baked good. Uh, my uh, friend who I used to live with, she used to do all sorts of crazy stuff with protein powder as a, as an ingredient. Like she'd make cookies and she'd make cakes. And we made these protein bars one time, which were absolutely phenomenal. They were like Cheerios and raisins and chocolate chips and corn syrup and protein powder. And they're just, oh, they're so good. Wonderful when going back on reskiing. Uh, so yeah, but supplements are like that. They are supplementing. There's nothing in a supplement you don't get from food. And my opinion, I've always found you just get more from food. You get better taste, better, better texture, better range of nutrition. Um, your supplement is just basically saying, I don't feel like I'm getting enough of something. This is a shortcut to get more of that thing, whether it's vitamin D or whatever, which doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, sometimes people think I'm against supplements. I'm not against supplements at all. I think they're fantastic, especially if people have trouble getting something like vitamin D or, or whatnot, but there's nothing special about them at the same time. Uh, there's nothing uh, unique enough or uh, uh, an advantage beyond convenience and just making it easier to get something. 
Ah, uh, Matt, get a fish weighing scale for your ISO belt. Now, here's here's one of the things that I've I've tried before, and um, the uh, the ability to quantify uh, isometrics is one of those things. I, I think I addressed this in my latest video. I'm not a big fan of it in most cases, to be honest with you, largely because it's a real big pain in the butt in being able to read that meter. Even the new ISO chain that Dragondor came out with, uh, when I first started using it, I'd look at the handle for the metrics, and after about two or three exercises, I'm like, this thing sucks. Like Trying to concentrate on a meter or a number, plus when you're doing an isometric like that, if you haven't done it before, it's not a number. <laughs> it's not very defined. It's not like you're doing 50 pounds of force it's like 50, 49, 48, 47, 52, 56, 57, 62. It's like brrr, all over the place. You, it's hard to make heads or tails of what it actually means. Uh, so m that's why my recommendation on the last video of do you need to quantify isometrics is for the most part, you're better off not. You're definitely better. If you're using isometrics as a warm up, as a technique for improving tension control and neural synergy in the first few phases of uh, grind style calisthenics, don't even bother. It doesn't even really matter. You're just trying to turn on the muscles. And with a finisher, you're just pushing it to a high level of fatigue. I don't really care what the numbers are. Now that could just be me because for the most part, I don't care about numbers at all <laughs> when it comes to fitness. Um, I don't really care much about uh, you know how much can you lift and how many pushups can you do and how fast are your 5K and stuff, I don't care. I'm always just more of how well can I do the exercise and I figure the numbers will just kind of take care of themselves. Uh, so uh, the exception though is if you're using isometrics as a primary strength and conditioning tool, if you're saying isometrics is a big part of how I'm going to get stronger, yes, then you definitely want quantification big time. Now, if you're using something like a fish scale or something like that, I recommend uh, making it in such a way that maybe you can watch it like in a mirror, something that you can easily see without modifying your technique. There's the key. Because if you're in a lunge, your chest is up and you're nice and you're high and the scale is here, you don't want to be like hunched down and trying to see it like this. It's just, it's way awkward for it to do. So maybe try to find some way. Um, I would love, I would love to see someone invent just a little electronic gizmo about that big with a couple hooks on it and you pull on it and it sends the numbers to your smartphone. That's the best way to go about it. Someone might have it. I tried searching for it forever, couldn't find anything, but that's what we really need is that way you can put it on a stand. You can put it somewhere where you can see it. It has audio feedback and stuff. That way it is something. But even then, I've been learning that when you're concentrating on your isometrics that hard, you don't want to be looking at anything. You don't want to be looking at a clock. You don't want to be looking at a screen or a scale or anything. You just want to be 100% concentrated on what you're doing. Uh, for those who do want to go the fish weighing scale, though, make sure you get something that can handle enough weight. You don't want something that's going to top out at like 30 pounds or something. Again, we want something that can go way into the red zone for more resistance than you can handle. All right. I think I beat that horse to death there. Uh, Chris, your top exercise circuit for an aesthetic upper body physique under a time crunch. Ooh, good question. So yeah, I would go with, um, actually, I would go with some sort of, not so much a, a, a push-up variant, but something that gets your pushing, especially in an upward position. So handstands, uh, chaturanga push-up would be really good. Basically, what I'm thinking is get the chest, but more importantly, get the shoulders and the triceps really good. So something like a chaturanga push-up that brings your shoulder through a very big range of motion and pull-ups. That would be my number one for an aesthetic physique because you're using your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist joints through a very big range of motion. Uh, you can adjust them through a very wide range of resistance and you can push them to an insanely high level of fatigue. Those two exercises back to back, I would either do a three minute test of one and then a three minute test of the other, two minutes if you're really short on time, or I would circuit the two back to back, 30 seconds of one, 20 second rest, 30 second re uh, on the other, or rest as needed to give yourself a good uh, shot. Circuit that sucker up for about four to five rounds, call it a day. That's what I would do. Good question, Chris, awesome. Adam, awesome, to, always good to see on here. Does tendon ligament work same as muscle? I've seen rock climbers do a finger plank. Uh, tendon and ligament, well, ligaments is different because those are the things that are connecting your bones. Tendons connect your muscles to your bones. So yeah, anything that's doing 
your muscles is doing your, your tendons. Uh, it's kind of like if you pull on a chain, it's saying, if well, if I pull on the chain, if this link is getting worked, is this link getting worked? It's like, yeah, it's all in the same thing. It's all getting pulled the same. So that's one of the reasons why I'm usually kind of skeptical of people who are like, oh, I need to strengthen my tendons and my ligaments and stuff because A, ligaments and tendons by design are supposed to be some of the strongest, most tough tissues in your entire body. Your muscles are, are supposed to be far weaker and less resilient than those. That's why in the martial arts, the old saying is it's better to break a bone than to rupture a tendon or a ligament because that stuff is so tough that when it goes, it usually goes big. And when it goes, it usually takes forever to heal. And it oftentimes does not heal nearly as well as it was originally. Uh, so the work that you're doing for strength will strengthen those things. Not that they may really need it that much. When you see things like rock climbing, uh, finger planks and stuff like that, yes, the, the, the tissues in the fingers that can adapt. I'm not saying it can't adapt, but it does adapt under lots and lots of uh, volume and lots of extreme duress. I mean, you're hanging your body weight off of two fingers like that. That's going to definitely send a lot of force through those tendons and ligaments, but it takes a while to be able to get to, up to that point. So that's why I usually recommend just, you know, make sure that you're uh, working strength training, basic strength training. If you're interested in things like I need to have really good grip, well then, you know, grabbing onto things like doorway, uh, rock climbing, ledges and stuff is the way to go. But it usually doesn't require anything new. All right, Zelfone, uh, love you, most amazing information channel is my favorite calisthenics channel, greetings from Peru. All right, I love it when people say where they're from because that's one of the great things about the internet. I love reaching out to you folks in Peru and Afghanistan, Australia and stuff. It just boggles my mind how, you know, when I was uh, starting as a trainer, I couldn't get people in the gym to pay attention to me. Now I got people all over the world. Thank you so much. What food is basic to recovery your nervous, uh, uh, your central nervous system? Um, well, basically, uh, fat is very good. Your fats have uh, a lot to do with your nervous system. Electrolytes, naturally, salt, uh, sodium, potassium. But uh, your nervous system is largely more recovered, more through sleep. Uh, than anything else. There was a, a book out, I think it was called Good to Go, and it was all about how do you recover as well as possible. Now, I didn't read the book, but my boss uh, at the gym told us about it, and he was like, the basic gist of the book is that like, if the top of the screen here is recovery, the bottom here is not so much recovery, like this is what you need to recover, right? Like from here to here, this whole section, this is sleep. That's how much sleep takes from here to here, this is food. And this is basically just your basic diet, like plants, fruits, vegetables, proteins, uh, get plenty of food, you know, don't be doing any sort of crazy restrictive diets and everything like that. And about that much, hang on, I gotta get real closer. That much, that's all the other stuff that's more fancy. Those are the saunas and the ice baths and the foam rolling and the massage and everything it takes up about that much of your actual recovery. So make sure you're getting good food, getting plenty of food and getting plenty of sleep. That's what is probably going to be most for your um, nervous system recovery. Oh, and stress, of course, your, your nerves. I mean, you know, your nerves can get frayed being stressed out from stuff on the job. If you're stressed out in traffic and everything, that's not gonna be good for your nervous system. So make sure that you're having time to chillax, relax, and I should take my own advice because I've been putting in like 17 hour days lately. But the more you can relax, the more your nervous system uh, will recover. Is it possible that low fever will come if I practice too much overcoming isometrics? Good, interesting. I don't sweat when I do, but I feel that my body is heating up slightly. Well, sure, absolutely. Uh, you're creating a lot of muscle tension when you do isometric training. And actually, a, in many cases, a lot more than you normally would dynamically. And don't forget that human metabolism is roughly 50% efficient, which means roughly half of the caloric energy that you're burning off is literally coming off as heat. That's why sometimes people can do push-ups and they're doing pull-ups and they're doing squats and they're like, okay, I'm getting warmer. I'm not doing too bad. And then they go for like a strap plank and they're holding like an L sit or something and just <clears throat> their sweat starts pouring is because that's pushing them over the edge. You burn a lot of calories for an isometric in that moment because you're creating a lot of tension. I don't think you're gonna in uh, risk of a fever, mind you. I think that's more of a 
chemical reaction to an invading uh, substance like a virus or something. I don't really know too much about illness and viruses and stuff, but I don't know of anybody who kicked on a fever through exercise. But yeah, you're definitely going to create some heat. <laughs> you're going to churn out those BTUs through isometrics for sure. All right, a couple more questions because I got dinner to eat. I got some pork and salad on the on the table for me. Uh, Tom, very thank you very much for the props. I'm thankful for fitness independence. I don't need to go broke with inflated free weight prices. Hey, man, I don't even know what free weights are going for these days. Back in the day when I first made a video, uh, I mean, this was Fit Rebel days. I made a video on how free weights were so cheap because where I was working, they were actually going for 50 cents a pound. I don't even want to know <laughs> what what's what uh, they're going for now. Probably, uh, you know, you got to go to a back alley and ask a guy if he's seen a black moose walking backwards on a moonless night to buy a pair of dumbbells. All right. Oh, Chris from Toronto, Canada. Love the insights. Please keep them rolling. Love Canada. When I was in Vermont, I went up to Montreal all the time, uh, partially because that was the only place we could get any sort of nightlife when you live in Burlington. All right. Jury, love the uh, avatar there. I loved that dinosaur show when I was growing up. That was a fantastic show. Uh, hey, Matt, what is, why is it so rarely recommended to, con to consciously perform concentric and eccentric movement of a rep? Are there any disadvantage? Greetings from Germany. I love Germany. Man, you, you are up at 3.43 a.m. Much uh, respect to you. I love Germany. Frankfurt, Munich, uh, Leonberg. I've got some friends in Leonberg. Fantastic. Um, yeah, consciously performing concentric, eccentric, rather than just kind of letting it swing and, and go, I'm assuming what you're talking about. A lot of times, here's the thing, is a lot of times the conception is that exercise works your muscle. So the mindset is if I do the exercise, maybe if I'm going through the motions, the exercise will take care of me. But that's not true. Exercise does not work your muscle on the eccentric, concentric, or isometric. Isometrics or uh, exercise does not work your muscle. You work your muscle to do the exercise. And this is not a chicken and the egg sort of con, uh, scenario where it's like, which one came first? You work your muscle, that's how you do the exercise. I gave this example just tonight with a friend of mine who's a biker, and I said, that'd be like saying your bicycle makes your legs work. Like, no, you work your legs to ride the bicycle. So that's why we always wanna be very mindful, which basically is a fancy night, new age word for pay attention to how we're using our muscles during things. We don't want to just drop. We don't want to just kind of fling it up because we think if I'm doing the exercise, usually that equates to getting something moving through space, which if you want, you know, a hundred pounds to move through space, just have someone else lift it for you. Don't bother. But when you're conscious of how you're using your muscle, you're getting much more of that work that of a higher quality involved. And I, I think a lot of people just don't understand that. Um, I, for one, took me years to understand that exercise doesn't work muscles. Like car bicep curls do not work your biceps. Pull-ups do not work your back. You work your back to do the pull-ups. It's the other way around. So I think that's the case there. Um, oh, good question. What do you think about MEV and MRV increase the volume through mesocycle for hypertrophy? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Especially with uh, shorter durations. Um, basically anything that's going to get you out of your comfort zone. When we're talking about periodization, we want to make sure that each uh, block that you're working in is different enough to elicit a good response. Sometimes one of the biggest mistakes that people make with periodization is they're like, all right, I did high volume training with five sets and I did low volume training with four sets. It's like, it's, it's too similar. We want to make sure that whenever you're considering adjustments within a periodized program, you want them to be sending a very clear, distinct, different signal throughout your body. So it's like, I did low rep, five. I did high rep, 20. There you go. Now we've got enough of a difference. So it's sure to create a different stimulus. And when it comes to hypertrophy, we want to have a variety of stimuli. Uh, this is one of my little philosophical things that I've started to notice a lot more throughout the world, but especially in fitness is that diversity brings more health and strength. The more different we can make things uh, and have a diversity approach, so diversity of reps, diversity of range, diversity of different exercises and approaches, the better off we probably are for building muscle. We get into trouble most when we're like, this is the one best exercise, this is one best way to do it, this is one best rep range. So we're very narrow in our approach. So instead of saying push-ups, 
for three sets of 10, you want to say, okay, I did that for one block in my periodization scheme or plan. It's not a scheme. You're not planning on taking over the world. Uh, but uh, it's like, okay, three sets of 10. Now I'm going to do dips. You know, dips push chain still, but you're going a different direction. Maybe you're going with weighted dips. So instead of three sets of 10, it's like five by five. So it's different rep range, different sets. You want it to be different enough. Hopefully that answers your question there uh, for, for that one. Uh, Jaden, good question on skinny fat. Watch your breaking out of skinny fat video. I know you said any exercise that pushes muscle is key for getting out of this physique. What further advice would you give to a newcomer? Awesome, very good question. Here's the thing. Skinny fat's a term on marketing. It's not a real thing. It's just you have less muscle and you have more body fat than you would like. So you want fat to go down, muscle to go up, which is like everybody on the planet Earth who's ever working out wants either one of those things or a combination of the two. And this is a classic example of how our perceptions and our beliefs about fitness have nothing to do with science and logic. Most of the way we think of fitness is based off of media. And it's not to say they're being deceptive or anything like that. It's because we are just surrounded by media, but usually don't drive down the street and see news reports on or, um, uh, you know, abstracts from scientific studies and research and stuff like that. We're surrounded much more by media. So that's taking up most of our attention and whatever takes up our attention is what we tend to believe. It's just a human condition. It's nothing uh, faulty or devious or anything. It's just, if you hear the term skinny fat several million times over the next week, your conscious mind is going to pick that up, put it into your subconscious and it starts to be adapted. And the media always uh, remember the media is just responding to what we are responding to from the media. So if someone puts out a blog post and they coin this term skinny fat and it gets much more likes then someone else is going to write that article and someone else is going to put out advice and someone else is going to put, and it starts to build and build and build because it's just getting attention. It's getting traction in the marketplace. So it builds up even though it's made up, <laughs> we just pulled it out of thin air and invented it. So the, the concept is always the same less body fat, more muscle. So work the muscle, build the muscle, control the diet, uh, make sure you're not eating too much, eat really good food, eat to satisfy and be active every single day. So the advice that goes with every other person trying to lose body fat or build muscle is the exact same for skinny fat because it's really nothing new or different. It's just something that came up from media. Got me rambling on there, but, but hopefully that uh, helps you, Jane. Oh, and here's the other thing that I wanted to mention too. Lots of times, uh, this is why we have very particular advice like, oh, you're skinny fat? Okay, therefore, on Tuesdays, if you're an Aquarius, you need to be working out facing 32 degrees northeast unless you're over six foot tall. Like, we get these recommendations and stuff that kind of formulate this idea that we're this unique snowflake and that we're so different and we need a different. No, you don't. Know a vast majority of people do not have specialized goals. Therefore, you do not need specialized programs. You do not need a specialized diet. You do not need specialized advice. The same stuff that works for everybody or across the board is going to work for uh, you as well. Things get specialized when you have a specialized condition like, okay, I've got this one injury or I'm allergic to peanuts and I hate the bench press. Okay, that's a little more specialized. Now we can get, make things a little more tweaked. But these terms that get thrown around in the media that are basically meaningless create this false illusion that you need something specialized when in reality you, you don't. Uh, Adam, also good question. What causes bubble gut or sometimes referred to as roid gut? Uh, sometimes you, bodybuilders are known for this, whereas it basically looks like you took a basketball and stuffed it under your shirt, right? Uh, Lots of different stuff. I mean, it's a hormonal thing. You've basically, you're looking at genetics as well of where you're storing subcutaneous fat. You're also looking at the intra-abdominal fat that someone may be storing there. Uh, lifestyle, lots of stress, lots of poor lifestyle choices, lots of uh, drinking, uh, fatty foods, lo low activity. All this stuff that we know is just kind of unhealthy is adding up. And some people display that a lot more than others. It's also just kind of a male condition sort of thing. Like guys, we, we store fat in our midsection more. And uh, the uh, like several years ago, I had a ultrasound done uh, for uh, determining body fat and stuff. And the company had my previous one on record as well. And I had gone up 2% body fat since like several years beforehand. And they could tell me at what sites in my body 
grew the most fat and it was in my gut. And they're like, yeah, and you gain most of your body fat in your belly. I'm like, well, yep, welcome to male gender. <laughs> That's the way it works. Uh, so, it, but it's largely kind of genetic. It's also a lifestyle thing. Uh, and again, uh, belly fat, that's another term out there. Like, how do you lose belly fat? Oh, you need to do this special program and this special diet, these special exercises. No, you don't. Uh, it's the same thing. We got too much body fat, pew, lose it. Uh, calorie balance, have more going out than going in. Make sure you're uh, building muscle. Make sure you're uh, expending a lot of calories. Make sure you're eating good food. Uh, that's the long and the short of it. And keep in mind that it's probably going to take a lot longer than you think it is. <laughs> To, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but a lot of times too, when people are struggling to get uh, results they want, they're just running around in that media, like, what kind of specialized technique do I need? And it's, no, <laughs> you don't need anything things specialized uh, for things like that. All right. One more question. Alex, how's the video on yielding calisthenics coming up? Absolutely. You requested this one earlier. Um, that's probably going to be coming out maybe tomorrow. Uh, these days I am super uber unbelievably swamped. So everything keeps getting pushed back. Um, this is a testament to why you need to schedule things because I'm doing this podcast right now because it's on my schedule. Like I know you guys are starting to get in the habit of oh, Wednesday night, you know, time for the live video kind of thing. If you schedule it, it gets done. And a lot of things like making my YouTube videos is something I'm like, well, I'll do it when I can find the time. And lately it's just been an absolute <laughs> busy, like crazy. Like I, I lay in bed at night these days and I'm like, God, I was busy from 4 a.m. until 1030. And I didn't, didn't really think I got anything done. How is that even possible? So uh, last weekend, part of it's because last weekend I was 12 hours on that bike race and, and then driving home from Vail. I mean, that was a that was an 18 hour day right there. So that really set everything off a little bit. So this weekend for sure, I'm gonna be cranking out the videos like crazy. So Sunday at the very latest. All right. All right, folks, I'm gonna get some dinner and I got some more work to do before I go to bed, but thank you as always for watching, listening, commenting, questioning, and everything. As a reminder, please check out the full RDP library down below in the description. You could go to reddeltaproject.com. I got a ton of free eBooks for you there as well. I don't even want your email address. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to be able to <laughs> send you spammy emails and stuff like that. Literally click the links and they're yours. It's just because I appreciate all the support you always send me. And uh, it's very much uh, what keeps me fueling. And even though I'm very tired and I'm very hungry right now, I love doing this for all of you. So thank you so much. I'll talk to you guys next week. ISO chain review coming out on the RDP YouTube channel this week. And of course, the yielding isometrics versus overcoming isometrics. What are their pros and cons? Talk to you next week. Till then, be fit and live.